everyone. Welcome to the Insights on Demand series of talks brought to you by Cambridge University Press and Cambridge Assessment English. My name is Ivan Sorrentino and I am the ELT and Education Marketing Director for Cambridge University Press in Asia, based in Japan. My talk today is especially for those of you teaching Japanese and Korean learners in either a monolingual or multilingual setting. In this session, I'll talk about the Cambridge Learner Corpus, what it is, and how it can help us. Then I'll look specifically at Japanese and Korean learners, what they find difficult, what is easy for them, and how we can support them. I will also look at how this compares to learners worldwide and explore insights from the Cambridge Learner Corpus for your classroom. But first, what is a corpus? Let me hand over to the language research team to tell us more. Imagine you had a question about language. Perhaps you could ask your friend, but what if their answer was different to yours? Maybe you could ask everyone in your town, or maybe you could ask everyone in your country. This is the basis of corpus linguistics. We analyse huge collections of language to find out how it behaves and how it works. We use the corpus in two ways. So first, to find out how English is really used, and second, to find out the language support that our learners really need. So we've got a huge range of things going from informal family conversations around the dinner table to academic writing, uh, to business English, to journalism, um, to text messages and emails, and all this allows us to have a really detailed understanding of how English behaves in lots of different contexts. So much has changed in the world over the last 10 years, and that includes language, so we keep checking to make sure that our syllabus and our course materials is up to date to reflect those changes. The Cambridge Learner Corpus is an unparalleled collection of learner writing. Made up of about 180,000 real exam candidate scripts from about 200 countries around the world. And this analysis gives us insight into how well the students perform, but also the support they need to improve. We use the corpus to supply the language that learners need to fulfil their ambitions and potential. So, a corpus is a huge collection of texts that we can analyse to find out how language behaves. It's about data and evidence. We use it to check and validate our intuitions and also to find out new things about learners that perhaps we didn't know. And the Cambridge Learner Corpus is the world's largest collection of texts written by people learning English. It is made up of students' responses to the writing sections of Cambridge English exams. The project has been running now for about 20 years and new texts are added every day. It tells us what learners can do at each stage of their learning journey. What does the Cambridge Learner Corpus actually look like? Well, this slide here shows what makes up our Learner Corpus. On the left, you can see the wide range of texts from the corpus, both generic general English texts and more specialised academic, business, legal, finance and life skills texts. Each of these exam scripts or texts contains information about the specific learner that provided them. And you can see that on the right. For example, the first language, the nationality, or even the age of the student. And then we have the annotation scheme. The exam scripts in the corpus have been error coded. A team of specialists worked through each text and annotated each error with computer readable tags. This means the corpus can be easily searched to find out where particular groups of students typically struggle. So which students have actually contributed to the corpus? The pie chart here shows the wide range of first languages spoken by our learners. And from that, we have 2 million words of data specifically from Japanese and Korean speakers across all language levels. So let's look at this in more detail. What can the Cambridge Learner Corpus tell us about Japanese and Korean learners? Well, first of all, comparing Japanese and Korean learners from those around the world, we find that Japanese and Korean learners make relatively fewer spelling errors, word order errors, and verb form errors. By that I mean errors with two plus the infinitive or with gerunds. So for example, have to do something, look forward to doing something, be afraid of doing something. 
This actually is quite interesting and not intuitively obvious. Japanese and Korean are both SOV languages, subject, object, verb languages, and English is an SVO language, a subject, verb, object language. So you would imagine that we would see more rather than less errors. Also, neither Japanese nor Korean use the alphabet. And so you could imagine that maybe there would be more rather than less spelling errors. One reason that these are less common is most likely that there is a lot of rote learning, uh, vocabulary lists and spelling lists, uh, word spelling lists, and also a rote learning of verb patterns and verb forms in both countries. One of the things that we can do though, is compare specific examples from Japanese learners and Korean learners. And here we find that there are errors that we find Japanese learners will make rather than Korean learners. So for example, the overuse of the preposition to, and for example, uh, I want to go to shopping, is something that Korean learners rarely make, or I will go to buy car, or I will go to buy train. Again, Japanese students are more likely to make these mistakes than Koreans. Also, you'll see a second example there of a missing in. So she was in the same class as me, a mistake that Koreans tend not to make. Conversely, Korean students will often miss for, I'm sorry I haven't written to you for so long, something that Japanese students tend not to do, or missing article in this particular case with make an impression. Not only does this film make an impression with its scenery, but. We do find though that actually Japanese and Korean learners have a very, very large overlap in the kind of mistakes that they make. Here are a large selection of quite typical um, mistakes. So for example, we will see singular plural mistakes, you can ride horses in the mountain, mountains. At the party, we played card game, games. We might find some word order errors with auxiliary verbs or the verb to be. In this particular case, it would be also would also be great experience. We might find errors with collective nouns. We urgently need to provide staffs, staff with training resources. Sometimes we will see collocation errors. So for example, here, we should have advertising campaign rather than advertisement campaign. And then also with spelling, sometimes you have issues of duplicate consonants, planned rather than planed. We also see common grammar errors. And as you can imagine, the determiner or article the and a cause a lot of problems across all levels. Um, sometimes we'll see them missing, as in the first example, the director will discuss the next plan. Or the third example, we look forward to getting a positive answer from you. And sometimes the articles may be confused, or switched between one and the other. So the second example, all of them will attend the conference that I was using instead. When the fourth example, they need the actually a person who can advertise them strongly. We also see a lot of errors that are based on verb tenses. And English, as you know, has many more verb tenses than Japanese or Korean. Now, in some cases, it may be a simple uh, modal issue, I'm afraid I would, will not be able to attend the meeting. But we will often find uh, simple straight errors where the present tense is used instead of the past tense or the present uh, auxiliary verb is, is used instead of was for past continuous tenses. Perfect tenses, well, have done, cause many, many problems, as do passives. It would be good if the seats are changed, were changed um, and even causative constructions also cause problems. It is too cruel for them to have monitored their feelings, whereas we would prefer it's too cruel for them to have their feelings monitored. Wrong preposition is also an issue, but notice here, the office is located on the third floor. Could you call Mr. Smith at Sony? The preposition is not related to the verb previously, but actually it is part of a prepositional phrase. It's actually associated with the following nouns. And those prepositions are quite, proposition errors are quite common. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. 
Vocabulary errors are also uh, not uncommon with Japanese and Korean learners. And interestingly, when we actually do some analysis, we find vocabulary errors tend to be more common in the higher levels. So more towards C1 and C2 rather than A1 and A2. And that may well be because the higher level students have a wider vocabulary and they are experimenting more with language and more likely to make um, verb or noun choice mistakes. For example, wish instead of hope, um, can instead of will, and a very common problem, go for come and vice versa. And that's also something that many uh, non-Japanese, non-Korean uh, students make when they're speaking Japanese or Korean. Another common uh, mistake is a uh, noun choice. And sometimes you may have words that look at least on the surface to be quite similar, such as travel and trip or cloth and clothes. And sometimes words that just seem to be synonyms but aren't quite synonyms, such as nature and countryside or job and work. I think it's worth adding to that that there are a number of false friends or loan words that have come from English into Japanese and Korean and now have their own meaning. Um, one that sticks in my mind is the word claim, which is a, an independent English word, but in Japanese it means complaint. Another word is consent, which actually is used for the socket in the wall, which you would put a plug in. Other mistakes uh, that you will find for Japanese and Korean learners are problems between adjectives and specific suffixes. So for example, various versus varied, grateful versus great, and a very common problem across many languages, but Japanese and Koreans in particular also struggle are with ing and ed adjectives such as boring and bored pairs, fascinating and fascinated. Interesting and interested also cause many problems. And then finally, we have the wrong word choice or the wrong part of speech. So the fourth example there is, I have two choices, which I'm interested in both. Actually, it should be, I have two choices and I'm interested in both. There's no need there for the relative pronoun. And sometimes it's just straightforward, first language or L1 interference. So how do you think about this is a direct translation from the original language. And in English, we would generally ask, what do you think about this? This slide here shows nine, of, uh, nine words that have one specific thing in common, and that is that they are amongst the top 25 misspelt words in both Japan, for both Japanese and Korean learners. Um, if we put aside differences of British and American spelling, uh, words such as a program that may be appropriate for TV, but not necessarily for computers. Um, some words cause spelling problems because their um, pronunciation does not match their spelling, convenient being a very clear example. Uh, other typical problems are also where you have consonant clusters, where the pronunciation itself may be difficult and that may impact how learners spell that word. Um, a commonly misspelled word, of course, is accommodation. But when I look at that word, I think that native English speakers are not much better. And that word is one of the most misspelled words across the US and the UK. Wherever you find many tourists, you'll find that mistake as well. So we've seen there a lot of different uh, errors that are quite common amongst Korean and Japanese learners. But how do they compare to learners from other countries? Are our learners so different? Well, actually, the research suggests that that may not be the case. On this slide, we show 10 of the most common learner errors. And if you look through the list, you'll probably recognize some of the errors that I've already mentioned from previous slides. These specific 10 errors are part of the top 20 errors for every single language group. And it suggests that corpus research can help us understand not just the problems specific to Japanese and Korean learners, but the problems that all learners typically encounter across their learning journey. Well, why would that be the case? Is English so difficult? I would probably argue that most languages are, are more or less equally difficult. However, each language does present its own set of challenges to learners of that language. And English does have a large set of spelling problems. One of the most commonly quoted 
is the pronunciation for O-U-G-H. And here we have four examples, though, through, thorough, and bow. But you could easily add to that list, thought, cough, enough, or my own favorite, hiccup. Not quite sure how we managed to pronounce it that way. And in fact, there are a couple more. Feel free if you know them to add them to the chat box or add them onto the Padlet later on. We also have rules that we pass on um, from a very young age. We're all familiar with the rule I before E except after C. And we also know that that doesn't work with neighbor or neighborhood. We also know that it doesn't work with science. And so these exceptions need to be added to the rules. Also, in addition to the large vocabulary of individual words, we have phrases, we have idioms, and we also have phrasal verbs that we need to learn um, as pairs or sets of words or chunks. In addition, um, English has many variations. Not only do we have the English that's used in the US or Canada, but we have English used across England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. But we also have English that might be used as an official language, such as in India. English also has a particular word, the, the definite article, that not all languages have an equivalent for, and Korean and Japanese obviously struggle there. And then with pronunciation, the TH sound is a perennial favorite amongst many language groups. Um, the R sound, the problem between R and L, the schwa, the uh sound, so problematic in fact that it has its own name, and of course diphthongs such as O and OW, which may provide problems for different language learners, different language groups. So what does that mean? I mean, what can we actually do with all of this corpus data? Well, let me give you an example of the kind of things that we can do as publishers. Um, we can use the information that we get from our Cambridge Learner Corpus to inform our course books. Um, sometimes, for example, uh, here we have uh, an accuracy check that is based on typical problems that we see from using the simple present and the present continuous. Uh, we know that um, students need to be helped with these problems. If they're not uh, dealt with early, then they can become uh, fossilized and be a problem for the rest of the learner's language journey. We also can see here a particular chart that shows problems of Preposition selection. So when is in used instead of at? When is in used instead of on? Or on used instead of in? When is of used instead of for? And this kind of data will help us know which preposition or preposition selection we should focus on for our grammar practice activities that we can also embed in our materials. But what can corpus uh, research do for you? How can you use corpus informed approaches in your teaching? Well, unfortunately, we don't have lots of time to discuss this in this particular session, but I would like to draw your attention to Niall Curry's talk uh, as part of the Insights on Demand event. Niall will share useful tools that you can use to work with corpora yourself and some guidelines to help you get started with corpus linguistics. You can check out other talks also on corpus linguistics as part of the event, such as areas like spoken English or language change. And that's it. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, if you do have any further questions or comments that we haven't addressed in the chat box or comment thread, then do head over to the event Padlet and leave your questions there. The event Padlet URL you can find just here. And all that remains for me to say now is a very big thank you for attending. I hope you enjoyed the session and do please leave any comments or questions that you have in the panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>